There we are, live! <laughs> Welcome everyone for one more episode of Let's Talk About Love with Rohit Janeja. Welcome, Rohit. Hey, uh, wonderful being here. Great to be with you guys. Thank you, Rohit. And with Andrew Shepard. Welcome, Andrew. Thank you, Selma. Very good to be here as, as always with me, Selma Patricia. It's an honor, a pleasure, a true joy being here and talking about love with all of you. And today we're going to be talking about um, a few things. And all of them we chose to put under this cap um, that we entitled Romantic Idealism. Okay, But we're going to touch on so many different things and aspects of the romantic love dance. So, <clears throat> romantic idealism, we can, we can explore this from so many angles. And um, one of them is, you know, all these crazy myths about romanticism, rom about romantic love. Um, some of them, you know, we all heard most of them, love conquers all. Yeah, and, and through love, I can change my partner, you know, um, and so many other ones. So I'm going to start by asking our beloved lover, Andrew, to start our dance today. All right. Thank you so much. Well, let's really think about the specific myths, not just the general uh, idea of... of of what comes in, but specifically the, the great stories that we've been told from childhood on. The knight in shining armor, vanquishing the dragon, and rescuing the damsel in distress. This, this kind of story is repeated in, in much, much, most of our folklore, most of our you know, storybooks, and our movies. And it is not benign. It is not just, oh, that was a sweet story. It made me feel good. This is stuff that is ingrained in, our, in the subfloors of our consciousness. This is stuff that when we have powerful visceral reactions in life itself, it may be underpinned by these stories. Maybe literally going, you know, men may be literally going after women who always seem like a damsel in distress because they feel this romantic power surging up within them like, oh, I must rescue this, this woman. And then we will fall in love and live happily ever after. And you, you're not even thinking those words, but that's what's going on inside the back of your head. In the recesses of your mind, that's what you're actually thinking. And so when men find that they're constantly seeking out damsels in distress, yeah, <laughs> and they don't know why, look at your myths. Look at the stories you've been told since childhood, the movies you continue to watch. And women are doing the same thing. Women are continuing, continuing to look for knights in shining armor, men who are powerful heroic heroes willing to self-sacrifice to, to save their woman, to put their woman above, above all else. Not saying that's wrong, <laughs> but saying that that really is, is an embedded thing in our folklore. And the fact is our culture has changed quite a bit of late, where women are vanquishing their own dragons. Women are standing up and, and living part of their lives as the public life that men have have been the only ones to lead for many centuries. Um, and they like it. They like being their own knight in shining armor. And so, but it's conflicting because of course women also have watched and read these stories and want to be saved by another knight in shining armor. So they have to take their armor off and become a damsel in distress in order to fulfill that that underlying myth. Well, we just need to see what this stuff is. It's not a matter of doing battle with the myths and the folklore of old. It's just a matter of being aware of it so that we are not being controlled by stories we've been told. We are being aware of what we're, our influences are and therefore we can think about what we actually want. As you said earlier, you know, what women are looking for and what men are looking for, I believe that we can be looking for those aspects 
and still be true to ourselves in that dance. And so that's, I, in my view, I believe that as we look at all of the way that we've been encouraged to dance religiously, culturally, habit, habitually, I mean, it's patterns that we fall into. Um, the, the, the important theory is for all of us to kind of uh, be aware of, of where can we look for that, for the hero in the man that we get into loving relationship with while recognizing that he's a human being with his own needs and at the same time validating our own needs. Right. So and that can be done. Well, I mean, I think some of, I mean, first of all, I want to say that, ask the question, do you really need a hero? Do you really need a knight in shining armor to, to feel fulfilled in a relationship? I mean, that's the first thing that I think is suspect. It may and be I'd based... Like to ask a further question on that as well. Do you need someone to fulfill your needs? Do you need someone to protect you? Do you need someone who is going to fulfill you? Do you need someone who is going to complete you? Is love about getting your needs met? That's a really important question to ask on top of all of this. Is it part of fulfilling a myth? Is it part of fulfilling a social obligation? Is it part of fulfilling a biological obligation? Is it part of being able to survive in this world? Is it part of putting away your fears? Take a look at what is driving your love story. If it is, drive, if, if it is your fears, it is your needs for survival, it is your needs for companionship, it is your needs for biology or, or social acceptance, then perhaps what you're looking for is a different model because this model of romantic love has been tried, tested and proven and shown to be an utter failure. There are other models that work extremely well in which people actually fulfill all of those needs and they do it for an entire lifetime and it's consistent. But those models are not acceptable to us. Those are models of the arranged marriage, for example, one which is socially driven, even arranged by parents. I mean, in those societies, like in India where I come from, marriages last a lifetime. In pretty much, you know, I mean, the, the, it's starting to change now as we're embracing the romantic idealism of the West. But traditionally, and I would say over 95% of marriages in India, and this applies to China, it applies to many other countries that I've spoken to people from, um, wherever the old traditions exist, still, marriage used to last and it fulfilled all these requirements. The requirements of society, the of biology, of our needs being met, of safety, of security, of everything. We have moved into a different arena, romantic idealism, and we brought with it the baggage of the past. The baggage of something that used to work in a particular model, but doesn't work in the place of romantic idealism. We really need to look at what we're trying to do. We're trying to do something that has no, literally no proven record. And we're going on bashing our head against the wall, bashing our head, trying to make it work, trying to get an army of therapists to help us, trying to get all kinds of people to help us, but it still isn't working. We've got to start questioning what's going wrong. Maybe we need to go back to the old way if what we want is our needs met. Or if we want the new way, the romantic idealism, it has to become more real, more in-depth understanding of what love is, of what romance is, so that we can actually get to where we're trying to go. Otherwise, we'll be in this in-between place, you know, saying as it goes, between a rock and a hard place. You're not able to, you have this vision of something greater, grander, more beautiful, and you're not able to go there. And everybody's complaining and miserable and unhappy that why are men not like this? Why are women not like that? You know, and, and so on and so forth. It's just, it's not, we have to break out of the bubble. There is a great, there's a great thing about romantic idealism and it's seeming to conquer the world, as Rohit is saying, that is not wrong. It is, it is clearly there's something we want about it. It is, a, it is freeing the heart to, to have more power within society, to say, I want to experience this passionate, powerful love that transforms me. I don't just want to sit in a comfortable marriage and raise kids and, and you know, find my fulfillment that way. I, I, my heart is yearning for more. And so the romantic, like, the romantic notion is there are good things about it. 
but definitely a shallow reading of it, a shallow reading of these myths of going, oh, well, as soon as I find my knight in shining armor, I'll be happily ever after, or as soon as I find my damsel in distress, I will have everything I want. You know, those shallow readings of these myths are damaging, for sure. They're not... You've got to dig deeper into understanding. There, there may be a biological underpinning to some of these these myths, to some of these stories, where it's it's like I really do need to feel like I'm being saved. But we need to watch out because a lot of these myths are based in a culture, based in a in, a, in historical cultures in which in which men possessed women, in which your father owned his daughters, and so the desire for a woman then to be possessed by her new husband, her, by her lover, is, is sort of really pinned, really based in a culture of, of women are property. And we, are, we have blown out of that paradigm. We are not living in that paradigm anymore. It's the objectification of women, which women have fought against and have won the battle for, and they're still playing out the same old romantic mythology, which came from that time when women were objectified. So it's very confusing for the male as well. And I'd like to point out another thing, Andrew. You know, this whole thing about wanting uh, to find a greater kind of love and, and this, this idea that when I find this, then I will be complete. When I find my ideal mate, then I will experience the, the, the love of my life is born out of the same myth that says, when I have money, then I will be happy. When I have my ideal environment, then I will be peaceful. When everything goes the way I want, then I will be satisfied. And the truth is, this is a big lie. This is the biggest lie of all. I have, I need to find my happy, because all of these things we're looking for, happiness, peace, love, all of this is an inside job. It's not something we're going to find out there. We're going to find it right here, and we've been looking in the wrong place all our lives. So if we turn our attention around, and find the happiness, the peace, the love, the contentment, the fulfillment, the completeness within ourselves, and then we go and approach love, we have a whole different story. We're not going to love to fulfill our needs now. We're not going there for biology now. We're not going there for social norms. We're then going there for love itself. And we then need to know what that is. But let's talk a little more about the um, about the traps along the way, because they're really hooking us and holding us down um, into an old paradigm that, yeah, we really need to examine. Yes, earlier when you said, when you asked that question, do you, do you, do we really need someone to feel complete and happy and fulfilled? That is the bigger. That is, in my heart's view, the biggest question of all. As, 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 there are several studies in, in psychology that indicate that marriage is where the partner or one of the partners get into the marriage um, already with a level, a high level of happiness by themselves on their own versus coming to the marriage looking for that happiness in the relationship. The, the, the relationships tend to last longer. And, and I wonder, when I read, I do these readings for school and all of that, and I look at all of that, I, I really, it makes me wonder, uh, why are we all not, and, and that's part of our work, the work that we all do, the, uh, we, the three of us at least do, is, is, is this encouragement for all of us to, to invite each other into that place of what is it that you are looking for? It's yourself or is someone to complete you, someone to come in and, as you said earlier, save you. And this takes work. It takes inner work. It takes that foundational work, if you will. And that is the biggest invitation for me um, when we look at all of this. I think this whole saving you thing comes from a religious ideal and um, a religious ideal in which we've been told that the Messiah will save us. So really what we're looking for someone to save us is the Messiah and I suggest that you go to some Messiah for that purpose, whether it be Christ, okay. or Buddha, whoever. I don't think you need a lover for that, you know. And frankly, here's the problem with being saved. 
when someone is there whose job it is to save you, then you stop doing things for yourself and you become lazy and you no longer look at how you can help yourself because you know what someone else is going to save you so why should you do anything it basically has caused laziness and spiritual retardation in the world today and has caused people to basically not take responsibility for themselves for their actions and for their for their for what they're creating in the world and it's 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 i believe it's the cause of the mess we see around us is is this lack of responsibility and putting the expectation on someone else to save us and if they don't save us then to blame them and to make them wrong for it which is what we do to our lovers if they don't successfully save us and then we say it's all your fault we hate them and we blame them and we knock them off the pedestal that we ourselves put them on so <laughs> it's a catch-22 nobody can really save us is what I believe you know, we have to save, if there's any saving to be done, it's we've got to save ourselves. But maybe even the deeper question is, do we really need saving? You know, aren't we just beautiful and wonderful just the way we are? You know, maybe we need to examine that. Maybe we've, stopped, we've put somebody else on a pedestal, thought we need to be like them. But maybe we don't need to be like anybody because we're actually so incredible the way we are. And perhaps if we drop in and look at, the gift that of this creation of how in, just the beauty of what we are inside and out will stop looking for saviors and will start realizing that we are the one that we've been looking for we are that most incredible being of all and perhaps it's time to put ourselves on that pedestal and yet maintain a great degree of humility at the same time because yeah putting yourself on the pedestal again brings us back to that place of holier than thou which again is a pitfall. So, um, you know, being and able to. When we do that, Rohit, when we do that, it's so much easier when we are able to get to that place. And that may require a little bit of a dance to some of us that are not used to that notion, to that concept, to that awareness um, of who we are and the beauty that we are. Uh, just as we are. I think that the moment that we, we accept that invitation and we embrace that, it becomes a lot easier to then look at our beloved in a completely different way. Now we don't demand. Now mutual exploitation, as we talked about um, before, it, it just doesn't, it just, there's no space for that because they are beautiful just the way they are. There's no demands. There's no expectations. And of course, there's responsibilities. A love dance requires us to be responsible. And, 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 it's, it, and it's a dance that, that we need to be aware and awaken to. That romantic love surge and urge and, and you know, that, that is sustainable, but it takes work. Yeah. Um, right. But it's natural. But think, it's not forced. Right. Yes, and I think once, you know, once you've found that self-love, of course, then then some of these romantic notions actually are relevant. Once you are complete in yourself, all of a sudden when you meet somebody who, who, with whom you have an incredible polarity where you, that just shakes you, you know, to your core and you, you have that connection and you are growing because that person has incredible differences from you. Mm -hmm. Well, then as, as long as you're not looking to be saved, as long as you're not there to... to to mutually exploit or find security, but you're actually there for the soul dance. Well, then that's going to be one hell of a soul dance. Mm -hmm. But you, but you, you, you come in with weakness and and um, you know, yeah, desire for for being saved or something, and you're going to miss that. You're not going to, you're not going to be ready for that. Yeah, I think this thing about mutual exploitation. It's time to talk about that a little further. Um, the fact of the matter is that if I'm coming to you for you to fix me, you know, take care of me, do things, then I am coming to you to use you. I am coming to exploit you. Now, while that might be true um, for some people, for others it is about having the beautiful girl on their arm. It's about an ego trip. Being I able can't. To that, you know, I got, you know, I got her. See, see what I got. I, I got, I got the best car, you know, in the block. I've got the best girl. I've got the best house. It's part of that ego trip. So, if you look at what drives us, whether it is the egoic drive of having the best, you know, the most beautiful, the most handsome, the most sexy, or whether it's the drive of someone fulfilling my needs, or it's someone who is going to be able to 
fulfill me in some way. Um, much of this is ego driven and it is based upon using the other for our gratification. And as long as we're doing that, that is exploitative. We are not there to love them for who they are. We are lo there to love them for what they can do for us. Mm. And when you're loving someone for what they can do for you, that is called exploitation. Of course, it's a mutual exploitation because both are using each other. And so it appears to be OK. But it's only in a little while that you, be, you know, that the wraps come off and you begin to be able to see, oh, this person really doesn't love me for who I am. They love me for who they thought I was. They put me on this pedestal. They idealized me. And now that they see my faults, they don't really love me. And therein begins the disappointment, which usually begins six months, a year, two years after you get married and start, or start living together. Uh, at which point, you know, when the flaws become evident, you're no longer ready to love them because, because in fact, what you were chasing was an image, an illusion that was going to satisfy your ego. And now your ego is all busted up because it says, oh my God, I, this isn't what I bargained for. This person actually is flawed. This person isn't actually going to give me the ego high that I wanted. And based on that disappointment comes most of our conflict and ultimately our breakups. So I'm proposing that we need to go to a place which is not ego driven and which is based upon what Andrew called the soul dance. I think it's a beautiful way of expressing it, where we come together to enjoy each other's uniqueness, where we come together as fulfilled beings, um, looking for the dance of love and how it wants to flow through us rather than what am I going to make out of love? How am I going to take love and exploit it and use it to, for my purposes? Which could be biological, social, you know, physical, whatever it might be. So, have, are you both familiar with the, the great story Pride and Prejudice? Mm hmm Yeah. So, let's, let's use this as a model for a moment. Because a shallow reading, I'll give you the shallow reading of Pride and Prejudice. Um, very smart, difficult woman to please, uh, holding out for her great love, finds uh, Mr. Darcy, who is fantastically wealthy and responsible, and he comes in, saves her and her family, and they live happily ever after. <laughs> That's a very shallow reading of that story. If you go deeper, if you really read the story, it's a long book, but if you read it, you, you realize that they're going through multiple tests of, of, of who this person is because he doesn't come in there and go, ooh, you're, you're beautiful and intelligent. I, I want you. You know, he doesn't come in there. He's basically being very cautious in the dance and, and making sure that she is who he wants her, uh, that, that she, is, she is of the character that he, that he wants, and she's being very cautious to make sure that he is of the character that she is she is wanting and there are multiple acts of you know acts of honor that have that happen before they have proven to each other who they really are and once they have done that they they recognize not only that that they're suited for each other in a sort of a practical way but that they really are um, that there is something deeper going on. I, I wish I could uh, it's been a while since I've read the book but I think that it, Many people who have seen the movie or whatnot get the get the idea that there are there are many layers going on underneath the surface that are that are really about finding out who is this who is this person that I want to to partner up with um, because it is not just about a wealthy man buying a a, a woman who who needs him, and it's not about a, 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 you know, it's not from the male perspective about a, about capturing a woman who is, who is brilliant and beautiful. It is, it is far, far more detailed. Yeah, which brings us to an invitation to start from questioning where are, what are our intentions where are we coming from what, what what is what is it that we're bringing into the dance and and that responsibility it's a self responsibility it starts here and so sometimes we do it the other way around what can he or she do for me 
what can he or she bring to to add to my happiness or my journey or so I, that look into getting to know each other from that at, at that soulful level that is that is a that is a big purpose of a love dance that is huge so then no. let's address the big issue then, which is about children, family, and so on and so forth. Because if we're going to talk about soul dance, and if we're going to talk about a much deeper understanding of romance, then what happens to all of this? What happens to all the concerns people have about biology, about their needs, and so on and so forth? And I would love to hear a woman's perspective, Selma, because this is an issue that is very dear to the hearts of women. And um, if you could, you know... Um, perhaps speak about that and maybe help you know gain a deeper understanding otherwise it's going to sound like there's these guys who want to kind of you know <laughs> railroad women into some trip of their own um, we don't, I would love for you to shed some light on that we don't want to just be you know eternal eternal bachelors falling in love you know multiple times throughout our lives uh, necessarily <laughs> there is not at all there is a desire for for most of us to have children and a woman obviously when she's pregnant and and breastfeeding is not uh, is not ideally suited to be solo <laughs> so having a man who can provide who can take care of her if they're the very least during those those really fragile years um, is significant and for for certain that's why it is in our folklore that's why it's in our myths yeah. I agree with that, Andrew. I agree with that. Um, as a woman, when when you ask me from you know a woman's perspective, um, I am a mother, and I love that's the world that I that is 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 so magical and dear to me that you know I'm even amazed that I only had one child. I and I love children on top of it. So 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 yes, when I initially when I was younger, I was looking for that someone that could become the father of my children and that is a need that we have, it's a biological need and it is there and it's undeniable. Now, what I, and, and I, I believe that most women naturally have this in them. Now, where does this, you know, where do we meet? Where does this biological need meet with that romantic uh, part of the whole equation. Well, for us women, and I am again talking in general and for me, one goes hand in hand with the other. Of course, with the exception of some cultural backgrounds where the marriages are arranged and so there's a completely different dynamic. So I'm coming from the dynamic that is known, more known to me. So yes, I was looking for the man that I was in love with to be the father of my children. Now there's a little bit of a, I believe these two fields beautifully can uh, complement each other and can flow with one another in ease of flow when us women understand the basic general needs that we have and that man have. So one of our needs is the need for nest. Is the need for it to be in our home with our husband and our children and you know and and have that beautiful nest and that is beautiful but and it is a need that a lot of us have and we have the need from our male partners generally of freedom of, of making sure that they make things happen and that they are useful and that they create something that makes the world a better place. They're they're providers and they're doers and they're they're on their they're they're on their journey and part of their journey is freedom. So sometimes we get entangled in this it's just not possible to have both. Well I offer personally the suggestion that yes, it is possible to have both nest and freedom. It takes a great deal of heart-centeredness and understanding of our own needs and the needs of our partner. So we go back to what we were talking about earlier, is this 
I know that for my man, my husband, the father of my children, to be happy, he needs to feel that he's he's doing a you know he's doing a big deed, whatever that is. But for him, it's important, and he makes the world a better place. And so, how can I fit into that picture, support him, uplift him in that journey, while still have his love and attention for our nest? And so then is an invitation for the men, and then now I want to hear from you. Do you, gentlemen, feel that there's a possibility that you can combine that freedom with that need for nest? Because for me, on this side of the fence, it is possible. We can do it. We can do it. I, can, I will be happy to see my man just soar the skies and go, knowing that our love is not dependent on, on him being totally always there in the nest with me. Then I then I bring up some big issues that women that. have. That Go brings ahead. Up big issues that women have. What you're saying, when you say sore, a number of things start to happen. One is that he gets so focused in on his work, he's not there a lot of the time. One of the big complaints that women have is that you not don't give me enough time. All right. So that raises that issue because he's now so focused in on his goals and his achievement and his thing, which he thinks he's doing for the family, but then which causes him to be away from the family, which then brings up this whole thing. So this is number one problem that occurs. The other is that as he's out there in the world making all that happen he, and, and soaring in his stuff, as he achieves and as he becomes, many other women start getting attracted to him. And to that extent, he then starts, you know, having affairs and he starts going into that situation. How is it possible for a woman to be able to accommodate this aspect of the male? Because this is the part that is not comprehensible to most women. And that question I, I, I have to answer with another question. This is up to the man. When he makes a decision that he's going to have affairs, or that he's going to be with other women, it is a very personal decision that I have to find a way by the way, respond and respect. Now, do you, 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 are, the you, are, you, and still be part of the and still, you know, you know, give, gift the one, the one, what is your, I don't think it's the two of us, what do we, what do we, that we're looking, that we're looking, what you're looking for, what you're looking for, what I'm 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 looking for, because sometimes we force men. men. They want to do something. something. And they come from this forceful force. You need to be a real man. You need to not just me. Not getting into any relationship. Not into intimate. Into intimate. No. And then it's okay. What's right or wrong or good or bad? What is it? What is it? What is it? Men and women. But you give me your perspective on the man. I need to add one more thing before we go further. Mm -hmm. One of the things that starts to happen is if either of those two things happen, as in terms of time or in terms of, you know, be in, in involving other other women that he starts getting involved with, women then tend to do something very interesting, which is to really come at him, either through nagging or fighting or breaking up or whatever. The, in other words, the man who was the hero for all that he was doing is suddenly brought down to the ground and as as Ma. And what then starts to happen is a complete rift in the relationship which normally leads to a breakup. Because what you said earlier is very vital. If the woman can see the best in him, can uphold that and keep him as her hero. Now, all of that crumbles when, when, he's, when, when certain needs are not being met or certain fears are being triggered or jealousy or all of that stuff is starting to come up or, or a sense of lack or he's not being there or his attention or whatever women then tend to go to the other extreme and that completely breaks the relationship. Now I'm not saying either one is right or wrong, I'm just starting to look at what can we do to accommodate each other's nature, to accept each other for the way we are rather than the way we want each other to be. Mm -hmm. This is really important. How can we accept each other's nature, mm -hmm. allow for it and allow both sides to be fully met 
the woman's need for security, the man's need for freedom, the woman's need for deep intimacy, the man's need for expansion. What is it that we need to do to reinvent this paradigm so that we can make it work for everybody concerned? Yeah, and now, and now the best strategy, the best for, strategy for women in this relationship, in this relationship would clearly not, clearly be, to not be to attack the man attack and try, the man to, and try to, to build fences around, around the attack of husband, <laughs> husband attacking all the women and the women in the world. Yeah, I'm hearing yeah, that on your end. That on your end. Some reason. I'm hearing okay. it all around. Yeah. Um, I'm yeah. hearing the echo. Are you still hearing the echo? Not now. Okay, I turned my volume down. Okay. So, the uh, rather than rather than playing defense and and uh, trying to protect her man from other women or attacking him egoically, um, the best thing is to, is to keep stoking the heart of that relationship. If you guys have an agreement um, of, of a monogamous relationship, then of course you want to keep building it. You want to keep um, nurturing that heart space so that your man maintains his, his boundaries with other women as you've agreed upon, uh, rather than you trying to take responsibility for him or attack him for, for seeming to flirt with other women. Um, but uh, the, I guess what Rohit is saying is really you know a challenge to this to that status quo. A challenge to is is it um, is the monogamous relationship when you have these extreme pressures? If if the man is constantly working and constantly away from the home, um, is it realistic? To have to to maintain a monogamous relationship, and in in many other careers in history, you know, sailors and um, soldiers, people who are away from home for months or years at a time, um, for them to not have any of their sexual needs met is 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 kind of extreme, just biologically. I'm not defending men who have affairs necessarily, but just saying that. There's a strong biological push for them to to seek satisfaction, and especially when they're surrounded by other um, attractive women, it's, it's 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 a difficult temptation to resist. Now, we don't have a lot of that in today's society. We have airplanes, so you can go back home and continue to to work on your your family and your love relationship. But uh, it, it's still it's still a common common quandary. Uh, but but what what was Selma's question? Selma's question really was, um, Selma, what else, can you repeat your question? <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess that I can rephrase it and make it shorter. I guess my my question really is, how can we support you in 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 your dance of supporting us? How can we be um, a vessel of 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 communion? Wow. Freedom. Now um, we need. So, I have an idea, and it's it's really about the structure of a relationship. Is not from the perspective of a bachelor, an eternal bachelor who just wants to continue to peruse new women. Yes, a monogamous relationship looks like a prison, <laughs> but. But from somebody who who recognizes that he doesn't just want to be an eternal bachelor, but wants to build something as well, a family per se, or a career in which that partner is is actually an intense, incredible asset to to his career, um, or and vice versa, he wants to promote her career. Um, that becomes more of a structure upon which you. You have built your power. You have more power within that partnership to take advantage of freedoms that you want. Given that, that you're free, the freedoms you want are not just to conquer lots of other women. Um, a monogamous structure can actually serve you to experience more freedom um, because you have more opportunities. You have more um, more power with which to explore things in the world. 
Um, so given that, that that your partner, you and your partner seem to have a, a common interest and a common expectation for your um, for what for what is acceptable within your relationship. What kind of freedoms are you both interested in? Well, it can be a, a, a powerful vehicle to explore them. Given that there's lots of understanding, given that you you do talk about these things. I think we need more specifics here because yeah, we're, we're sort of uh, circling cir circling around in generalities. The specific I'm I'm really trying to get to very specific stuff that is troubling. So you brought up the biology of women and the needs they have for nest and structure and so on. We've talked about the biology of men, which is around freedom, and 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 so on. So if we're going to accommodate one, we need to accommodate the other as well. And if you're going to accommodate the other, most women say, well, you know, if you can have freedom, then I want to have freedom as well. So that's part of the biology. And that is a choice. I think the bottom line here is we all have choices. Yeah. And sometimes we get lost in the midst of trying to... We, sometimes we, we even lose track of what we want. Right? What it, what, because now we're in the middle. I'm, I'm in love with him, but I, this is unacceptable. But I love him, and if I don't accept this, I will lose him. And if this, and then it's just all this, you know, all this entanglement, Here. you know? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> royal. So I, I believe that it all starts with really being responsible into looking within. What is more important to you? What is more important to to me, uh, you know? And if it is that I have a man that does not, you know, go out, stray out with other women and, and all of that good stuff, then that's what it is, and I'm going to be, I'm going to have a rough time, but it doesn't matter. It's what I want, and I'm being authentic into what I'm being called to do. What is it that I, where do I feel more at home? And so I do that dance. And if it comes to a, a space where this is what I want and you want something else, then, then you know, it's time for a next lover. And so I think, I think Rohit, specifically, it all starts with being very responsible in that inner search of what, what it is that makes me that brings the best of me, that brings me alive, where do I feel at home, and then try to find a way to communicate that with our lover, and be very open to listen, read your heart's ears, what is it that brings him more alive, and if there's a middle ground, then there, there you go, you have nest, you have romanticism, you have love, you have, you have it all, even if it's just for a moment in time. And that's another myth of the romanticism, uh, romantic idealism, which is that love lasts forever. So we touch on that one, because that may last however long it lasts, you know, because we shift, we grow, we change, it's just part of life. So, so my question in that then is, do you... If you have a if you have a marriage partnership and you've got children, do you main do you allow your partner to have other partners, other love relationships without it to destroying the marriage? Because it seems to be our collective uh, assumption that if a partner has an affair, well, that relationship has been destroyed. The trust is broken, and it will never be repaired ever. And that's where each one of us needs to come in and answer that. I cannot answer that for the collective right. woman. I can't. But you know, the question but is, how are you approaching that? Are you approaching that from your conditioning? Are you approaching that from your what you were told love is supposed to be or marriage is supposed to be? Or are you approaching it from this moment, from you and me where we are today with no conditioning? Are we looking at it from now? And if we are looking at it from now, are we embracing all of who I am and all of who you are, right? And saying, you know what, I know this is happening, I know this is where we're at, but we have this wonderful family and I am not going to destroy the relationship we have spent so long building. I am not going to let go this precious love that we have just because your biology is kicking in in a different direction. 
you know, I am not going to let that happen. So I'm going to stand right here by you. I'm going to accept you the way you are instead of hating you for the who you are, instead of nagging you, instead of trying to bring you down. I'm going to accept you the way you are, and I'm going to say, all right, where, how can we proceed from here? I love that. I love that. That's what love is for me. I'm not saying it has to happen, but I'm no, saying it no, does no, no, no. happen to a lot of people, and instead of lying and cheating, can we just talk to each other and accept each other the way we are, where we are at this time? Because we may have started off with a complete intention of monogamy and complete intention of, you know, till death do us part and so on and so forth, which is wonderful. You started off with that idealism. But, you know, idealism is idealism. And vows are vows and promises are promises. Reality is a whole other ballgame. And when reality hits, and it may never hit in this direction, and thank goodness for that, and it's wonderful your ideals are lived out and they are fulfilled and you never have to look back again. But for those of you that reach that crossroads where those ideals are not being met, where someone is doing something other than what they should be doing or what they promise to be doing, I think it's really important to you know look at each other not just from an idealism of what romance is supposed to be, but from the realism of who we are or where we've reached in our journey and say, okay, what can we do from here? How can we not break up this marriage, not break up this family, not you know suddenly leave our children high and dry, not hate each other, but just say, okay, we started with this, we have landed up here now, what can we do to make it work? You know, we start trying to suppress each other, control each other, how can I love you just the way you are? Right yeah, back, to the back, to the, back to the practical side for a moment. Selma, I mean, don't you think, though, that statistically, you know, maybe 70% of marriages experience infidelity, and two-thirds of those infidelities are, are by the males mm -hmm. because they have a higher biological tendency to want to explore. Mm -hmm. um, women are more interested in the nesting than they are in the exploration statistically. So how do you feel about that? I mean, is it you might you might be feeling like you want to keep nesting while your man is like I I have biological you know I don't I don't love you quite as intensely as I used to I want to explore this other relationship you know how do you feel <laughs> you know I I'm maybe I'm not the best woman to <laughs> to answer that in the way that I don't I don't know that I okay so for me. It's interesting that you say that because I was reading some studies that suggest that women have sex first for, you know, because there's a sexual attraction, second, and that's tied, one and two are together, they're, they're you know, one in two, and that's a physical pleasure, and third comes um, love and commitment, and that, that was really interesting to me. So, so I think the whole, I mean, there's a general you know, statistically, as you said, um, Andrew, that's what it's shown, and, and from our culture, that's what we see. But having said that, I, you know, for me, if I will, what I want is to honor what we want. So be, truth, be truthful to what I want while finding a way to accept and understand where you are. So in that case, if you are the man that wants to have more sexual encounters and you are my lover, then all I would like is for us to talk about it, right? So I can understand, is there anything that I am lacking? Is there anything connected with our dance that is taking you to that place? Is it strictly biologically need to explore? Because I think that the courage to share what's going on here is what will start breaking all these barriers. So if you share with me, then my loving heart will want to understand. Because I'm coming to that encounter of sharing with a predisposition to understand. Right? So half the battle is won. You got my attention from the understanding point. And then if I, it comes to a point where I say, you know what, I can't live with that, then I'm just going to look at you and say, Andrew, I love you dearly, 
And I and you know, and one of the things that I am willing as a woman now in the last decade is to try it first before I say I can't do this. How can I say I can't do this if I don't even give it a try? An honest, heart centric try. Mm. And so after the try, if the answer is I can't do it, then I'm gonna be honest with you and say I love you dearly. I wish you all the best. I can't do this. So I hope that helps. You know, mm. you know, Rohit said it in the first time I interviewed Rohit. He said, you know, for all of those people seeking a monogamous relationship, if you want to make it work for a lifetime, constantly be reinventing yourself. Mm. Because that is the only way that mm. us with the human creatures who desire diversity, who desire variety, can sustain only one person for a lifetime. Is to continually be re-exploring, figuring out new aspects of yourself. You know, dress up for sexual time. Do you know costumes? Do uh, you know find other sides of yourself and your heart and the shadow side of who you are that you have never explored. Find mm -hmm. that dark edge that you are afraid of and explore it with your lover because that's that is one other strategy to to getting there to 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 making them feel fulfilled uh, yeah. as well to explore all sides of you so they don't go wow this other person is just rocking me because of something that they have it's like well how much more can I explore of me before you need before you really so, do need to find somebody so we're, else we're designing a workshop for women and in, in that workshop for women, we were talking about, a friend of mine and I, we were creating this workshop for women. And in that, we were talking about some of the skills women need to stay in their feminine, to keep the man completely dancing around them. And one of the very important things we talked about is mystery. Never reveal all of who you are. Never reveal. I mean, there's this whole big push about all the secrets, telling everything, da 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 but a woman needs to remain a mystery because then she's always unattainable for the man. A woman needs to be unattainable. If she is completely attained and if she is completely his, he loses all interest. But if she is, she continues to stay a mystery, keeps surprising him, keeps reinventing herself, keeps exploring, as Andrew said, her edges, her dark side, her this, her that, then she is constantly a puzzle to him and if she remains a puzzle an enigma he will be hooked on her in a way that no matter so this the women in the past knew this and today's women don't seem to get it that you don't it's not about just revealing all of yourself which is what we think is love and intimacy it's about revealing and hiding it's about the veil it's about revealing a little bit of the face and hiding the rest there is a part of this dance of mystery that is so alluring to men that a woman who has in a strip club would not be as exciting to a man as a woman who is veiled and just shows a little of her face and her and through her eyes gestures to him would be far more exciting because she's the unattainable remember to the extent that you are unattainable you are attractive to the extent that you are a mystery, you, you will be desired. And that's the key for them to keep the male alive. Now, if he's got everything, then he will keep running to something that he cannot attain, that he cannot have. It's not your fault. It's not that there's something less or wrong with you. It's that you've put it all on a golden platter for him. And you well, that's very interesting. Mm. That's very interesting because, because the the anticipation of the mystery is is in exact parallel to seeking God. I mean, it, it brings the woman and your love up to to the um, the divine, to the sacred. It makes it all sacred. When what you're trying to find in your woman is that that mysterious piece that you can't quite define. Yes. There are many Sufi songs that talk about God as being hidden behind this veil. And they talk about lift, lift that veil and let me see you. And, and why do you make me so crazy in your love by hiding your face from me, the face of God? 
but the same thing applies to the face of woman. It applies to the same. The same thing applies. So, so women have thought that by revealing all, whether it is their bodies, whether it is their dress, whether it is, you know, their 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 in, in, insides, that they are going to attract the male. And they're, you know, the point is to do that to some extent, and then take it back again, and then to keep changing and to be. So that is again. It it is truly if you want to move into the sacred and into the sacred relationship. It, it is truly about loving as your lover as God, your lover as that sacred feminine, as that sacred masculine. Mm. And when we move into that sacred arena, love starts to take a whole different perspective. It is never the same. It is nev your, your lover is never the same. You are never the same. And the relationship that you have is never the same. Mm. So the moment you try to tie it down to being the same, but you used to be that way, and how come you're like this now? Well, yeah, that is what happens. And let's keep flowing with the changes individually and collectively and keep on you know, expanding into being mysterious to each other. And, and rather than hating the changes that occur, I remember in my first marriage thinking, well, how did she change so much? What happened? You know, how how could how could she she used to be this way, and now how come she's like that? And and was it something I did? Was it something she did? I was just analyzing this mentally, instead of recognizing that change was inevitable, and that change is the beauty of the relationship, and change is the most wonderful aspect of relating to either ourselves, to each other, or the divine. And in that change lies our opportunity to expand. So I love what you said, Selma, about being curious. About being curious about the change that has happened and the newness of the dance that now occurs. You know, as you're throwing another piece in there, you're throwing another new element in there. Okay, now how do we dance to this one? And something else is thrown in. Now how do we dance to this one? And instead of looking at it as beginnings and endings, so this is what I was having this discussion yesterday with someone. I said, we see the world as black and white. I love you. I hate you. I like you. I dislike you. I agree with you. I disagree with you. This is a black and white vision of the world. And this is how we look at love. You know, you're, it's on or off. Um, but in between black and white is not gray. It's color. The color is where you start bringing in change, where you start looking at the infinite hues of what we are capable of and who we become and how our relationship unfolds. That is the colorful dance. Otherwise, we are in black and white zone. And in black and white zone, everything is on or off. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's a scary place to be. It just, it, it, it's the mental space, actually. But the soul of the place of the soul is the place of color, infinite variety, infinite change, infinite evolution, and and, and, and you know, the, dancing dynamics. So, yeah, this black and white. I mean, it's so much too about the ideals of your partner. You know, what are your the expectations we we carry for what our partner should be like? I, mm -hmm. I meet so many women who are making lists of mm -hmm. of, of the attributes their man ought to have. You know, it's like, no, he's got to be like this or else forget it. And so they, they've got like a 40-point list. <laughs> has to be over six foot. Has to be a wealth. Has to be at least making, you know, six figures. Has to be, drives a really sexy car, dresses really well. Um, he's, he's, he buys everything. He's incredibly kind and intelligent. Loves my mother when he meets her. Uh... Uh, you know, uh, does philanthropic things, loves children, is sexy as can be, you know, uh, really really knows how to charm me. You know, basically they, they construct a list of qualities that no human being could possibly be expressing simultaneously. It's like, okay, that's a gay man and, <laughs> and a player and a mama's boy all in one and you, it's not going to happen. It's just not going to happen. And so then they're like, oh, well, I've never met the right one, you know. And so they're sad, lonely, and, uh, you know, start to disbelieve right. that love can even exist for them. 
That's right. right. A beginner is hard, but I dance with all my kids. There's no list. First step, let's let, see the list. Okay, let's put, trash the list. Let's go from essence. Oh my God. Yes, I, Andrew, you're so on on target with that. Yes. Let's. It, yeah, that's such a that black and white. Get going. <laughs> yeah, such a black and it's white way. That's the problem with love is that you shouldn't be thinking it all through. I mean. You need to think about things, but you need to let your heart lead no matter what. If, you, if you're thinking it all through analytically and you haven't even heard what your heart has to say about this human being, well, then you're lost. You're completely lost. That is not going to lead you down a heart path. It is... Yeah. So for those people who are in that place, I would recommend for those who are seeking, you know, this path that you're talking about, the list, this is like a Google search where you put in too many criteria and nothing shows up. The more criteria you put in, the less is going to show up. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> For those who are speaking, I have one simple thing I say. Don't look from your head or from your mind at all the criteria and qualities. Seek a vibrational frequency that matches yours. And it has nothing to do with anything your head will ever figure out. It has to do with the energetics that when you meet someone, you feel you enter into a timeless zone in, that, in the presence of that person. That you suddenly enter into a place where, wow, we've been sitting and talking for three hours and I didn't even realize it. There's mm -hmm. something right there that you need to look at. And let your heart open into that. Allow yourself to go there and see where the dance of love takes you rather than trying to create a discernment or a label, no, this person is a friend, and this person is a lover, and this person is a this or a that. Leave the labels aside and follow the dance of love. Know that you are a vessel for love. That love is not here to be used by you, but rather you are here to be used by love. You are that empty flute that is to be played by the divine lover who wants to use you and play the melody of love through you. And the dance between two lovers is so unique that it can never compare to that of any other. And that when you allow love to use you, you will find the most exciting and beautiful experiences that love will, make, will lead you into. So just a word for those who aren't in committed relationships, aren't in monogamous marriages, but who are seeking love. Seek love and not a lover. Seek love wherever it is going to find you and let it guide you, let it take you. And its presence will be known by that uplifting feeling of peace, of timelessness, of joy, which are all elements of spirit that, they, that move through you. And if they are happening with another person, then allow it to take you wherever it wants to take you. Be in its dance. Let it surrender into it so that you may become, as, as Gandhi said, become an instrument of, who is it that said, because I want, let me be an instrument of thy peace. In this case, let me be an instrument of thy love. And, and look at love from that perspective. And perhaps therein you will find the deeper love that you're looking for. And perhaps that will then become, one day, the cultural norm. One day become the tribal uh, way of bonding and relating. And that if we can stay at that level of love rather than the level of survival and needs, we may build more conscious and more beautiful and more long-lasting relationships and deeper romances, which is really what our soul desires. You know, the, the desire for romance is truly a, a divinely driven thing. I don't see anything wrong in that, except that the Victorian notion of romance, you know, and, and the ideals that came from that era are very, very limiting and are very counterintuitive to what love actually desires. But if we would tune into love itself as an energy of the divine moving through us, we will begin to experience love in a whole new way. And our romanticism, our desire for romance, will become far bigger and, and more incredible than anything we've ever imagined. This is my experience, this is my truth, and this is what I want to offer into the world, to say that we are far more romantic and desirable and greater lovers than we have ever allowed ourselves to be. So I invite you to open up 
to a to a vast new possibility of love that cannot be defined by our present paradigm. Beautiful, Rohit. Thank you. Andrew, <laughs> final thoughts? It's great. I just, um, I guess to just, to, just to speak on, uh, since Rohit has articulated the, the heart's yearning so well, just to speak on um, articulating the practical side of society, um, you know, I think that, you know, if if a woman gets pregnant, maybe it was not planned, um, you know, you don't have to treat that like a prison, necessarily, but you have to respect and, and, and honor what that is. I mean, if a if you are going to, you know, if you if you've impregnated a woman, you have started something, and you need to follow through <laughs> on that. Not not out of a societal sense of, you know, your expectation, but out of a personal sense of this is what I have begun. This is my personal seed that I have put into the world. Um, it does not necessarily mean you get married and do the standard, you know, societal thing, but. Legally speaking, you will probably be asked to, to provide child support at the very least. And so you, you, might, as well, <laughs> you might as well step forward and, and, and take responsibility for that, but, but, but figure it out because your, your heart really needs to continue to lead you. So, so there's a practical side of figuring out how can I serve the societal, the societal needs, which is to help, to help a woman raise her child. If 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 you're if you've created that, um, to you know help help a woman with the nest her nesting instincts to honor her nesting instincts, and to also honor your heart's desire for uh, freedom, which is which is quite universal. Um, it's it's not a it's not all or nothing is the thing. It is not all or nothing. You need to be able to embrace. Um, what is real and practical about society, but reject everything that is the assumption, everything that is the shallow reading of the myth that says, "Well, you have to, you have to marry her, you have to uh, get a get a stable job, you have to do everything to be honorable, and and basically lay your heart down like a carpet and walk all over it until it's flat." That is not the reality we're living in. It is not. You do not have to accept a prison ever. Yeah. But we do need to honor what other people are going through. As a woman who is now, you know, a woman who is pregnant, that's nine months of her life dedicated to that's a very right. interesting, beautiful, and often physically unpleasant experience, <laughs> followed by ch uh, breastfeeding and ch you know, and 18 years of responsibility for uh, yeah. for, uh, for helping a life grow up into the world, which is incredible. And gorgeous, and you have to, you want to be part of that, frankly. But, but we need to make sure that we are, at the same time, honoring our heart, because you cannot allow your soul to to take a back seat, really ever. You need to be able to juggle both of those pieces at the same time. Thank you, Andrew. That is so beautifully put. Thank you. I've just had one thought around that, and that each of these is a polarity: security and freedom. If we go to either extreme, we create a we create chaos and something that is unworkable. If you want only security and no freedom for your partner, you're going to create a situation that he will want to break out of. And if you want only freedom and no security, which is the eternal bachelor or eternal single person, then again, there you are, you know, sad, lonely, and uh, with no one to come home to. So the dance between the two, it's never about the polarity, it's about the dance between the polarities, between both of them coming together in this beautiful intertwining of freedom and security, both simultaneously, of responsibility and free-spiritedness, of all of these things coming together at the same time. And now we're in something that is actually real, that embraces all sides and every person's needs. Um, rather than just one side and one person's vision of how things should be. So, thank you. Thanks for that. Yes, thank you for that, Rohit. Yes, that, that's finding 
a space somewhere in the middle is, you know, that sacred divine space yeah. that we can find together. Mm -hmm. And Andrew, thank you so much for bringing up that. I think that we can even do an entire episode dedicated to that particular aspect of the responsibility of um, uh, uh, um, the male responsibility in the planting of the seed that is to have a child um, and have a woman become pregnant. I think that that's, thank you so much for sharing that. I think that's very empowering, very important in, the, in this dance. So thank you for sharing that. It's time to go. <laughs> Again, <laughs> thank you for the dance. My wonderful lovers, I love each one of you dearly, and I love what we create. And, you know, I'll end by saying this. Somewhere in, in the middle, in that divine, sacred space, that, that romanticism, you know, meets practicality and reality and all of that, keep your heart open. Stay in the space of your heart. As Buddhists say, the heart is not just this living organ. It is a divine space within us. And its wisdom is never ending. Never, never ending. Never underestimate its wisdom. So listen to it. And as Rohit said, do not look for a lover. Look for love. And let that love guide you. Just surrender to your heart's callings and all will be always well, even when it seems it's not. It is. So that's it for today. Rohit, thank you. Andrew, thank you. I love you both and I love each single one of you listening to us today and always we appreciate your time. That's it. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.